Stanford Law School and Stanford Community is very uh, lucky to have Ambassador Limbert here today. Uh, Ambassador Limbert uh, received his PhD from Harvard University, joined the Foreign Service in 1973, and has held a number of overseas and headquarters based positions. Uh, these included Deputy Coordinator for Counterterrorism in the State Department, Ambassador to the Islamic Republic of not Iran, Mauritania. Uh, ambassador to the American uh, ambassador to the I'm sorry, and the president of the American Foreign Service Association. In November of 2009, Ambassador Limbert was appointed the uh, first ever U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near East and Iran. Uh, in, in, in 1979, as most of you know, he was uh, uh, held captive, a hostage uh, after the uh, U.S. Embassy was run over by uh, young Islamist students. Uh, and he was there for 444 days. Uh, he holds the uh, Department of State's highest award, highest award uh, that is the uh, Distinguished Service Award, as well as the Award for Valor, which he received for service during the hostage crisis in Iran. I please welcome Ambassador John Lewis. And he 
said, uh, and he says, they are, they are so happy. <laughs> they are just so happy and they're so content and they thank the students for treating them so well and they're so comfortable. Um, and, you know, I always, I, I have asked myself sometimes, I hope that sometime I'll have a chance to meet with him again. <laughs> because that is absolutely shameless. How he could have said something like, uh, uh, something like that. But I um, speaking of uh, bad hair and bad male fashion, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen Argo. <laughs> uh, well, that was what it was like in 1970 and 79. Oh, please. So, uh, I assume that you saw Argo. Um, what was the? How did you think about it? Obviously, and since Argo is the uh, 900 pound gorilla in this room, right? Um, what did you think about it? How accurate was the uh, production, and why was it so? Why did it struggle for? It's a good question. First of all, um, I have to admit I liked it. Uh, I mean, I'm a sucker for good movies. <laughs> Well-made movies. There, there was there was there was good suspense. I knew, you know, we all knew how it was going to come out, but we were still sitting on the edge of our seats. And when, when that, you know, in the theater where we were watching it, uh, when the plane took off, everybody cheered. <laughs> and cheered in the movie. There was, there was suspense, there was Hollywood comedy, um, there was, there were um, uh, stupid bureaucrats, uh, there were clever CIA people, there were, there were spies, there were spy thrillers, political, uh, political thrillers, there were, there were bad Middle Easterners, there were good Middle Easterners, I mean, all the elements that go in to make up a good, um, um, a good movie. Uh, now, what, you, what I'm sure most of you know is that the basic story of Argo is true. <laughs> That uh, the embassy was when the, when the embassy was attacked on the fourth of November, 1979. Six employees were able to make their way out of the embassy um, and take refuge um, with our well, I forgot part of the, with our with our Canadian uh, colleagues for about uh, a little over two months, uh, a little over two months, and got out. Were able to leave the country. Um, under, with false Canadian documents, under the guise of a Canadian film, gr uh, film group. That much was true. Now, a lot of the details, which made the movie so interesting, exciting, were not. There was no scene in the bazaar that you saw. There was no um, housekeeper that you saw, that Iranian housekeeper. The, there was certainly no uh, chase through the airport. <laughs> And down the run and chase down the runway. They, as a matter of fact, they just walk. Basically, had their documents. They walked through the airport. That would have made bad. Uh, that would have been a pretty bad movie. If they had done it. Uh, the other piece of it, which I'll, I'll share with you, is uh, my favorite piece in the whole movie is the scene uh, where Alan Arkin plays the producer uh, and. He bargains for the he bargains for the rights to this script to Argo. There's that wonderful scene, and I, when I saw that, I said he has to win the Oscar for best supporting, and he did get nominated for it. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't get it. I thought he, he deserved it. It's probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. And I asked uh, I asked uh, Tony Mendez. Um, we were together at one of the showings, and I said, Tony, was that true? Did that happen? And he said, no. <laughs> it didn't, uh, because the Argo script, he said the Argo script was so bad, <laughs> nobody wanted it. And we just picked it up for nothing. Um, and that was one of the little uh, pieces of it. Uh, so going back to the uh, 444 days that you stuck in Iran, um, tell us a little bit about how the embassy was over how uh, they came in, what happened. Uh, just a little brief sort of uh, narration of uh, those days and uh, from the beginning to end. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the history, I mean, the history is, is, is pretty, well, pretty well known. Uh, all 
on um, on the 20th of October, 1979, uh, we learned uh, at the we at the embassy learned that uh, our government, our president, uh, President Carter, had decided to admit the Shah to the United States for medical treatment. Uh, the day before, he had learned, President Carter had learned, for the first time, that the Shah was seriously sick, that he had leukemia, and that he was in Mexico. He was in Mexico, and that according to what the President was told, he needed to come to the United States immediately for cancer treatment. Uh, 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 for cancer treatment. Uh, until that time, President Carter, backed by Secretary Vance, had resisted admitting the Shah to the United States, uh, based in, in part, at least, on advice from the U.S. Embassy, which said, if, um, if you admit the Shah to the United States, you put us in serious jeopardy. Now, serious jeopardy, think about it. That's not a TV show. <laughs> That's Diplo speak. <laughs> or if you do that, we are road kill, essentially. We're done. <coughs> We're done. We're done. Well, uh, based on the new facts, based on the fact of the Shah's illness, which, uh, now the Shah had been ill, was diagnosed with cancer, believe it or not, in April of 1974. The U.S. government, with all of its um, intelligence apparatus, and all of its analysis, and all of its this, and all of its satellites, um, did not know until October of 1979. So, five and a half feet, five and a half years. Based on that new information, Secretary Vance changes his mind. President Carter is left isolated, and he decides to admit the show. He decides to admit the show. When we learn this, the message to us is we are expendable, essentially. It's too bad. Carry on as best you can. Carry on as best, as best you can. We're doing this for our own reason. What we knew, I think, was something bad is going to happen. We don't know what, we don't know what it's going to be, but it's not going to be good. And when the embassy was, when the embassy finally was attacked, it took about 12 days before it was attacked. And we can go into sort of what we know from about the people who did it, because we know a lot about it now, um, now we didn't know before. What it looked like we were dealing with was, at first, um, was a 1970s style student city. Now, some of you in this room will remember that. <laughs> will remember that period. Um, I don't know if Stanford was a big center of that sort of thing. Yes. Was? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Berkeley, sir. But, you know, here too, but, okay. but I mean, if you remember in those days, you, we, you, you marched in, you took over the president's office, uh, you drank his, drank his scotch, uh, you smoked his cigars, uh, write his files, issued a brave, you know, 18 point communique, and marched out. And essentially, that's what we thought we were dealing with. And that's what a lot of the attackers thought they were doing at the beginning, making essentially a, politi um, a political statement. Therefore, our priority within the, emb within the embassy was, look, uh, and this is accurate in Argo. And there's a scene in Argo where our security officer tells the Marine guards, look, don't start a war. Don't, get, don't start shooting. Uh, you're going to get us all killed. If you do, you'll get us all killed. And that's exactly Right. And to this day, I and my colleagues owe our lives 
to the discipline of those 20, 21 year old Marine security guards who, did, who had the training and the discipline to follow the orders and not, not fire. So that's what we thought we were dealing with. Um, by processes still not entirely clear, unknown, uh, unknown uh, the event uh, transformed itself from a student sit-in, 70 style student sit-in, to an international crisis backed by uh, and the action was no longer just the action of a group of uh, 22 year, 22 year old, 23 year old engineering students. That's what most of them were. Um, but now it was backed by the authorities of a sovereign country. And now you're dealing, now we're dealing with something very different. So again, assumptions that we had at the beginning, not only myself, but our government, our government was uh, some adult in the room is going to step in and finish this. Kick these guys out. 24 hours, 48 hours. <coughs> well, it turned out there were no adults in the room. Or the adults in the room sided with the kids in the room and figured they could use this for whatever reason. And this is a process that people are still unraveling as to what happened. But basically what happened went from a 1970s style sit-in into a huge international crisis that uh, cost, it went on first of all for 14 months, uh, it cost Jimmy Carter his, pres his presidency. It cost Iran and Iranians um, incalculable losses. I mean, you cannot really calculate the cost of this to, to most uh, Iranians. What happened? Um, it earned um, an Oscar for it made a good movie. It made a good movie and still casts its shadow over uh, U.S. Iranian relations today. Well, May, Long well, answer to short. Very, very great answer. answer. I'm, I'm very glad to learn that most uh, <coughs> hostage takers were engineers, students, uh, not law students. We rarely ever <laughs> take any of our clients on the front. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but going back, fast forward into today and the movie itself, a lot of mixed feelings about our Why do you think that was the case? Mick, mixed feelings. Among Iranians? Iranians, uh, Iranian Americans, Americans, uh, people thought of the film, some people thought it was a conspiracy. The movie's coming out of that sort of uh, uh, the times of tensions are high between uh, Iran and the West. Uh, but it did strike a chord, and it did. And some of these issues are still very relevant and present. <laughs> um, it did. And in that sense, although it wasn't pleasant, for a lot of people, um, it probably is, it is a good thing because I think it serves as a reminder that the issues from 1979, what happened in 79, 80, um, are still there. They've never been resolved. And many people, perhaps on both sides of the divide, uh, would prefer that it would go away. Uh, my understanding is that the, the, on the Iranian side, this movie has made uh, has made many people rather uncomfortable because it's reminded people of a very difficult uh, and unpleasant and frankly ugly chapter in their own history. This is not something one is normally proud of. I mean, we have things in our history that we are not proud of. And they're difficult, frankly, for us to deal with. <coughs> well, this is the same. This is the same for the Iranians. And if um, the reaction had been up until this movie, the reaction had been the the, the, the I hate to use this word, the narrative.
narrative. It's so overused. But the, the standard version of events had been, oh yes, that happened, but it happened um, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. <coughs> nothing, nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. Yes, some people did that uh, a long time. Uh, if if you pressed, if one pressed, and I have pressed, in fact, I even pressed the Iranian, the current Iranian president on this issue in one of his visits to the United States, his, his response was, well, we treated you pretty well, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, pretty much the same thing that here. And that has become sort of part two of the narrative. One, it happened over in another galaxy somewhere, and even if it did happen here, actually, because we're such nice people and we're the heirs to a 7,000-year-old culture, uh, we could, of course, never mistreat anyone. It wouldn't have to, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't happen. Uh, and what Argo has done, and I, as I said, I think it's a good thing, even if it's uncomfortable, has forced people, it's, it's, it's torn, a, if you like, it's torn a, a scab off a wound. That's not pleasant, but at least it has forced people to confront this uh, very ugly uh, reality uh, from 30 years ago. Uh, speaking of President uh, Ahmadinejad of Iran, uh, his second term is up in, very, in a few short months. And uh, the Iranians are getting ready for yet another presidential election. Given the uh, current situation with Iran and the West, uh, the nuclear dossier, and also the sort of Iran nuclear crisis, and the negotiations that are ongoing, uh, recent round being in Almaty, uh, Kazakhstan, how do you see the uh, diplomatic efforts sort of going forward? And uh, what do you think is going to be next if diplomatic efforts were to fail? <coughs> Okay, I'm uh, I'm a little bit unorthodox um, on this, uh, and one reason one reason I am is because by by training and background I'm, I'm a historian, and so you know so when you when you're dealing with Iran when I when I think of Iran I always then go back into history. Um, and of course, when you go back into history, you end up somewhere back in the book of Daniel. Uh, and you remember how the book of Daniel talks about the laws of the Medes and the Persians. This is, there are references to this, to Iran 2,500 years, 20, 2,500 years ago. And to try to make sense out of, out of, out of things. Um, look, uh, the problem is, the, we have, we and the Iranians both, have gotten ourselves focused on the nuclear issue. Uh, it's important. It matters. But it is not the only issue. It may not even be the key issue. The key issue, as I see it, is how do we get out of um, a 32-year estrangement between our countries that certainly does not serve our interests, the U.S. interests. I mean, President Obama uh, said this very clearly when he was still Senator Obama. Um, if you remember his debate with Secretary, with the then Senator Clinton in 2008, he said, if I'm president, I will talk to um, our adversaries, including Iran. And she threw up her hands and said, oh, horrors. We can't do that. Um, well, of course, then she became his secretary. He said, American politics are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, if the only the, the situation has become that if we want to get out of this, Getting out, first of all, getting out of this, um, what I call, cycle of futility, 
downward spiral of fertility. Getting out of it has been hard. It's been probably more difficult than anyone had people had foreseen. My view is that the nuclear issue, um, to go to focus on the nuclear issue, to work specifically on the nuclear issue, if you'll forgive the phrase, to hold hostage other things to the nuclear issue, uh, is not the way out. Why not? Because the, the nuclear issue um, has become so suffused now for both sides with testosterone. It's loaded with testosterone on both sides, and neither side, both sides have painted themselves into rhetorical corners. Uh, what the concessions that we want the Iranians cannot give, the concessions that the Iranians want on things like sanctions, for example, we cannot give. Uh, 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 we cannot give. And so we're, we're, we're stuck. And the issue has become uh, so central and so emotional and so uh, difficult as, uh, for both sides uh, that if that's the only thing we talk about with the Iranians, that's the only thing we can talk about with the Iranians, we're going to fail. We're not going to. We're not going to go. We need to find uh, something else. You know, in, in in Iran, there's a famous place in Esfahan called the Ali Hapu, uh, the, the 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 high gate, the splendid gate in Esfahan. Well, our Hungarian friends. I discovered that our Hungarian <coughs> friends have a saying that says, if the if the Ali Hapu is closed go to something they call the Kishkapu, the little gate. Look for the little gate. Uh, well, the big gate, uh, right now the big, to, to, in, in my view, it seems to me the big gate of the nuclear issue is, is blocked. Uh, and we need to look for that Kishkapu, the small gate, somewhere. Uh, it may be about, we may have to talk about Afghanistan, we may have we may have to talk about uh, navigation in the Persian Gulf. We may have to talk about uh, uh, Iraq. There may be other, is uh, uh, other issues that we can talk about. But to find something that we can talk about, something that we can talk about first, before, and then maybe going back to the new issue. Again, a long answer. Great answer. <laughs> Speaking of these little gates, these quiche hoppers, mm -hmm. uh, which reminds me of hoppers. <laughs> right, right. Um, one of the uh, most important issues to the Iranian government right now is what's going on in Syria. Uh, for the most part, they are going to lose their last ally if Assad were to uh, collapse. Um, would that be a little Kish And B, how would you assess the Iranian government's hold in the region post Assad? And let's begin to, first we're going to address whether Assad is going to fall or not, and what you think U.S. involvement, Western involvement, that should be in that. Uh, okay. Uh, in a reasonable world, uh, in a reasonable world, we and the Iranians would be able to meet quietly, not, not in public, you know, but our representatives, I don't know, in our ambassador in Mongolia, for example, their ambassador in Mongolia, uh, away from the press of the world, for example, would meet and say, you know, let's talk about Syria. Let's talk about Syria. Without public posturing, without uh, speech making, and we would find common issues. I mean, neither of us obviously wants to see a Syria run by uh, jihadists, uh, extreme Sunni, uh, extreme uh, uh, Sunni. Neither of us want to see a Syria uh, recreating the Lebanese civil war. Uh, and but, that, but that's in a reasonable world. <coughs> Unfortunately, 
We don't always live in a reasonable, uh, a reasonable world. Uh, make no mistake about it, Syria is a serious diplomatic embarrassment for the Islamic, uh, the, uh, for the Islamic Republic. Now, there, I mean, there is it's a simple issue, uh, a simple uh, moral issue that when Iran was on its own, left on its own to fight against uh, Saddam in the 1980s, and just about every country in the region supported Saddam, supported Saddam as eventually did the United States and much of Europe, uh, Syria was a good ally to Iran. And Iran, the Iranians have not forgotten it. They have not forgotten about that. Uh, this, of course, was, uh, was uh, Bashar's father. But there is that idea of obligation. Of, of obligation and that's, in, that's, in, that's important. But uh, <clears throat> Iranian, uh, you know, if you, Iran has a strategic problem. It doesn't matter who runs it. It doesn't matter if it's a Shah. Doesn't matter if it's a warlord. Uh, doesn't matter if it's Genghis Khan or anybody or uh, the, the modern Genghis Khans. I don't know. Uh, doesn't matter who runs uh, uh, who runs it. Iran is different from other countries in the region. Uh, it's different ethnically and linguistically. It is different religious re re religiously. Um, it follows, in, unlike its neighbors, it is not Arab, it is not Turkish, uh, it is not Pakistani, uh, it is not Sunni, like all most of the other countries in the region. Anybody here, um, does anybody here study the Crusades? Follow the Crusades. In the Crusades, uh, around, sometime around uh, 1100, as the European armies were departing for the Holy Land, I'm told that a contingent of troops from Brittany showed up, of Bretons. And people said, who are you? Who are you? And they said, we're, we're Christians, just like you. We want to go to the Holy Land, take part in the Crusades. And said, the trouble is, though, they said, well, wait a minute. Uh, you speak a language no one understands. And you worship saints that no one's ever heard of. Um, and I see the Iranians as kind of the Bretons of their, 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 their region. I mean, Hazrat Abbas, you know, if you're a good Saudi, who is Hazrat Abbas? Who are they talking about? Who are they talking, are they talking about? Or this language that no one else, that no one, no one else speaks. So you have a natural isolation compounded by a um, monumental diplomatic ineptitude. I mean, the Iranians have a reputation of, uh, they have a, we have a stereotype of the Iranians as being very clever, as being very smart, <coughs> they are, but their diplomacy in the last 30 years under the Islamic Republic has been truly and monumentally bad. Um, that has succeeded in now they have, they are at a point where, uh, in their whole region, writ large, they have two friends. They have two friends. One is Syria, which is definitely on the ropes in the bad shape. Do you know who their other friend is? Did you guess? Armenia. <laughs> Armenia. This Christian country of a landlocked Christian country of about four million, uh, because they both hate the Azeris. As it turns out, neither one can stand the Azeris. The Azeris. So that's why Armenia. But that's not terribly good diplomacy if those are your only friends um, in in the region. Uh, for a while, for a while, uh, Iran could use. Um, the rhetoric, the pro-Palestinian rhetoric, it beat the Palestinian drum uh, to sort of get out of this isolation that it was in. And for a while that worked. Syria, however, uh, 
has made that pro-Arab stance into a bad joke. Because now you have Iran, uh, Iran this Shiite, non-Arab country, supporting a government that is murdering and using Scud missiles against its own Arab people. So that particular passport into the, into the Arab world is gone for the Iran. So the longer the situation goes on, the more it deteriorates, the more difficult it's going to be uh, for the Iran. Azadi just came out with a poll recently that shows how uh, the Iranian government in Iran has fallen in terms of public opinions in the, in the Arab public opinion. In 2006, right after the uh, 33 day war between Hezbollah and Israel, uh, Ahmadinejad and the Iranian government were very popular. And I think what the, the, the air strain and the uh, Syrian uh, conflict has definitely played a major role in this sort of lack of confidence and trust for the Iranian government. Um, Again, go back to uh, the question of, and I'm going to ask one more question and open, open it up to the, uh, to, the, to the audience to ask questions, but go back to the issues at hand. Uh, we have a president who just got reelected, President Obama, uh, and he is dealing with somewhat of an opposition Congress in the House, uh, and it's not easy to relinquish and revoke sanctions single-handedly, but he does, and our Constitution gives the president uh, Executive power, especially when it comes down to foreign policy. Uh, how would you counsel and consult the president, if you were, um, in reaching out not just about Iran, but those quiche hobbies that you mentioned earlier, the small ones? Well, uh, you flatter me. Uh, I'm sure it comes as a shock to all of you, but uh, the president doesn't normally call me up every day and say, What should I do about Iran? Um, <laughs> what should I do about it? He's clearly very concerned about it. And my own view is, uh, and this is entirely a personal view, uh, and entirely a, a personal view, uh, based on no insider information at all, is that uh, he has set his priority that we are not going to get dragged into another war in the Middle East, and that uh, he is simply, that's not going that's not going to happen. There may be, you know, <coughs> there there is always the danger. There is the danger of mis misreading, with conflicts, escalation, whatever whatever it is. But his priority and his the marching orders of his advisors is: we are not going to get into a war. We're not going to let anyone else drag us uh, into uh, into a war. Uh, part of this is political. Uh, I think this is, was shown in the last election. This was a major political bene benefit. What the, the, the course of events in Iraq and Afghanistan, whether for good or bad, but this was a major politi uh, 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 political uh, plus um, for the president. Part of it is uh, a matter of presidential prerogative. That the, pre the president, and it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't, I don't think it would have mattered who won the election, the last election in 2012. Uh, well, it would have mattered a lot in, the, in a lot of ways, but in this particular case, whoever is the, pre whoever is the president is going to guard his foreign, his prerogative to make, to do foreign, uh, foreign policy um, against the, um, uh, against the uh, we've got two mics in the aisles. Uh, we're going to open it up to the audience. We have about 20 minutes left. Uh, please be kind. Questions only. Uh, if you have a comment, please, uh, after 2 o'clock, the uh, ambassador will be here for a few minutes. One question and questions only. And the aisle will open. I'm brief questions, probably, so other people can ask. Every time that you're talking about the crisis, take the mic off and turn it on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, every time that we talk about the, the crisis with Iran 30 something years ago, it comes to our mind about the helicopters and towers. About the 
helicopters in Tabas, ah, the Russian, Russian government. The Russian. After uh, the, this movie, uh, Iranian governments and some of those people that they were in this uh, kind of apparatus, they said that, you know, we were talking about the storm in Tabas, sandstorm in Tabas that caused the helicopter to fall down. And now we are revealing that it wasn't a storm. We said it was a storm and American people accepted that it was a storm, that kind of clash, all of those helicopters. And there is some documentation, some rumors that uh, they say Russian people kind of uh, uh, shoot at uh, those helicopters. Can you elaborate, elaborate about that, see what was the story of that? So the question is about whether the uh, Soviets had anything to do with uh, diverting and hurting our rescue effort and, uh, and uh, U.S. forces went to Iran to rescue the hostages and it was an incident and uh, some servicemen got killed, whether uh, that was an act of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, espionage or act of sabotage by the Soviets. Uh, to, the, to, the best of, to the best of my knowledge, no. Let me... Uh, let me just also pay my respects to the people on that mission. I mean, that was a very gutsy and brave thing to do, and particularly to the eight uh, uh, airmen and marines who lost their who lost their lives at, at, uh, at Desert One. Uh, what I understand, to the best of my knowledge, what I understand happened is at this ref this was a refueling and transfer point that the. The, uh, the Army force, the Army Rescue Force, was to transfer between C-130s and helicopters. And the, hel and the helicopters were then to fly on to Tehran to carry on their, to carry on their mission. The helicopters were also to, uh, to refuel. Um, there was no, I think you are right, there was no sandstorm. However, um, on the ground, it was dark. This was done at night. The C-130s and, heli and helicopters could not shut off their engines. The engines were going. There was noise. There was darkness. There was sand picked up by these aircraft. There was radio silence. Everything had to be done by hand, uh, hand signal and, flash and, and, uh, and flashlight. And in the confusion, uh, one of the helicopters uh, attempted to reposition itself as it was being refueled. And this was in the dark. This, by the way, at, uh, the decision had already been made to abort the mission. Even before this accident, this tragic accident happened, uh, but they were still refueling the helicopters to fly them out so they could fly them out. Um, as a helicopter, in this darkness, sand, noise, radio silence, one of the helicopters repositioned itself, it got disoriented, the pilot apparently got disoriented with working with the ground and hit a C-130, hit a C-130, uh, and in the resulting, in the resulting explosion, uh, the eight people were killed. That's the story as I, as I heard. So as we continue with our uh, very brief questions, if you'd like to introduce yourself to an organization, if not, go ahead and just uh, ask questions. Uh, you first, then we'll go to uh, this. It's been very informative, Ambassador. Thank you. My question is, did you see parallels with the Libyan tragedy in the embassy last year with your um, storming of the Iranian embassy? And what lessons would you hope the State Department and our country has picked up from both? Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you for your, thank you. For, everyone heard the question? No. No. Hear, no. Hear the question? I'll get, the question was, are there parallels with what happened uh, on September 11th, 2012, in Benghazi, uh, and the loss of Ambassador Stevens and the other uh, Americans, uh, Americans there, uh, are there parallels? Of course, of course, there, of, uh, of course, there are. Uh, the lesson, uh, the lesson for me is, um, if we are in, a, if we are going to send our people into danger, difficult and dangerous situations, we have to do, we do it with our eyes open. If they can be protected by the host government in the first, in the first instance, then well and good. Um, in the case of Benghazi, 
you have to ask the question, just as you would in Tehran, you, know, you would in Tehran, if there's no, if the situation is dangerous, and if there is no protection, for, uh, if there is inadequate protection and security for our people there, then they shouldn't be there. This is not, this was the conclusion, by the way, also, of the State Department's Accountability Review Board. Uh, under Ambassador Pickering, uh, when, they, when they went. So, and clearly, in Tehran, on the 4th of November, 1979, we should not have been there. Um, and people ask, why were you there? But we were, and had to, uh, and had to, deal, and had to deal with it. But the situation was known on the ground, the lack of security was known, and yet we were still, we were still there. Thank you, Stanford. Thank you, Ambassador coming very informed to talk. Uh, my question is the, to add the first uh, question here. I think President Carter in his book did not mention that mentioned three or two Iranians were in that mission because of the family. He did not want to mention the name. If that's true, I just wanted to add that. And my question is that uh, when Ambassador Bruce Langan, Charge of Fair then in uh, uh, Tehran, he was meeting Sadat uh, al-Fladeh in the foreign ministry at that time of takeover. These are the facts that uh, apparently reported. And he knew that those six people, and al knew that six people went to the embassy in Canada. And uh, of course, as you mentioned, Sahar in the film was not there. It was a lady attached to the Ambassador of Canada, but they did not mention her name. She came later to Canada. I just wanted you to uh, shed some light on these two questions. Thank you. Everybody heard the question back? Okay. Um, how much, uh, how much the, you know, who knew that the uh, American, there were Americans hiding out with the with the Canadians, and what did they know? I don't have precise information. I strongly suspect, however, Mr. Moyne, that you are correct, and that um, within the foreign ministry uh, and other parts of the Iranian government, which were still in the hands of professionals at the time, there were suspicions, at least, about Americans um, hiding out. But remember, these people, these professionals, detested the student, the student, the, the, the captivity and what they had done, um, probably as much, if not more, than we did, because they knew what the long-term effects on the country would be. So if you were working, if you were a professional at the foreign ministry, if you knew about this, the last person, the last thing you would want to do would be to give it away to the hostage hold, hostage takers, because there was a power struggle going on inside inside of Iran between those uh, uh, between those groups. So I suspect there may be something to that. Something to that. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I also appreciated your talk very much. Uh, you noted that the uh, events of 1979 still cast a shadow on the. Uh, U.S.-Iranian relationship. <clears throat> and I want to ask you about two other events and uh, whether and how much of a shadow they cast on the relationship. One, uh, the U.S. action, as I understand it, in the blocking uh, Security Council action uh, at the time of Saddam Hussein's invasion in 1980. Uh, and the other is a much earlier uh, unsealing of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh and uh, replacing him with the Shah, which was of course a U.S. British thing way back in the past. I wonder uh, how much they shadow they cast on the relationship at present. Okay. The uh, question was, uh, we're talking about um, um, events in the past that cast shadows over the current relationship. And the gentleman cited two. Um, one was uh, the U.S. indifference or position, uh, when Saddam was, when Saddam Hussein 
uh, invaded, Iraq, invaded Iran in September of 1980. The second was the Oko coup of 1953, in which this, the CIA, the American government, was very was involved in over, overthrowing the National Front leader, uh, uh, Mohammed Mossadegh. Uh, all they all do. All of these events throw their shadow. I I uh, say what the way I put it is that um, when we and the Iranians uh, are together in a room, uh, there are also there are ghosts in that room. Um, I call them the ghosts of history. And like it or not, even if it's not Halloween, they're still there. And that includes the ghosts of 1953, the ghosts of 1979, the ghosts of the of 1980, the ghost of the Airbus 1988 that was shot down, the ghosts of Beirut of our Marines in Beirut, uh, uh, in Beirut, the ghosts of people like Morgan Schuster and Baskerville. Maybe it goes all the way back to the ghosts of Turkmen Chai in 1828. I I don't know. You know how much it is, but they're there, and uh, we ignore them at our peril. Um, we, one, and you must at least the, the way to deal with the ghost is to at least acknowledge their existence. Uh, I often say that what our relationship needs, uh, what the U.S.-Iranian relationship needs, is the Ghostbusters. <laughs> Remember Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray, that wonderful movie. <laughs> they, they, they had these machines, kind of like a vacuum cleaner, and they pick up the ghosts and put them into the canisters and lock them away, some lock them away. We need something like that. But they're all there. The point is, the point is that uh, what happens, and what it happens as recently as Two weeks ago, I recommend that you go to the website of the Asia Society in New York, and you will see there a discussion between uh, Ambassador Thomas Pickering, senior American diplomat, now retired, and the Ambassador Mohammad Hazai, who is Iran's uh, ambassador to the United Nations, or the most senior Iranian official in the United in the United States not accredited to the United States, but in the United States, and in this discussion. And in this discussion, you see Ambassador Hazai uh, reciting his list of grievances, going back to 1953, including 1980, including the shooting down of the Airbus, um, including this, that, and the other, the list, and the list of grievances, the list of grievances. And somehow, uh, we, if, if, if we're going to break out of the stalemate that we're, that we're in, uh, we have to get beyond simply reciting uh, lists of grievances to each other. Otherwise, we end up, uh, as I said, like an old couple you know, locked in a bad marriage. Um, and all we can do is talk about the past misdeeds of, of the other. Yes, you admit they happened. You say, yes, that happened. That was wrong. That was wrong. That was the wrong, that was the wrong thing, to, uh, uh, thing to do. You confront them, you, you, face, you, you face them before you can build some better kind of relationship. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my name is Sina, just a concerned citizen. In the last two years, you've seen uh, regimes fall that were friendly to the United States and give way to fundamentalists in T Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and uh, Yemen. And the United States is actively looking for their support. Um, and considering these changes, why didn't they, why did the United States actively seek the support of the Green Movement in Iran back in 2009 when um, that movement was 
up and going. It did not have much of a fundamentalist uh, aspect to it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question is why, it, and this, this is a, a, a question that one hears quite often actually, why the United States uh, did not do more to support the Green Movement opposition in Iran back in 2009. On the other hand, while it did support um, uh, the, some of the opposition movements in the so-called Arab Spring, Arab Spring. Um, many, many Iranians have noticed this. Uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the slogans, one of my favorite sort of slogans that was quite popular in Tehran back in 2007, I believe, uh, went something like this. They said, Tunis, Tunis, Iran, Natunis, <laughs> means uh, Tunisia could, Iran could not. Uh, Iran could not, in other words, we, the Tunisians could overthrow a dictatorship, we, we could not overthrow it. Um, the, green move, the Green Movement, I would make a couple of uh, points. One, let me just say personally, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of the uh, Islamic Republic. <laughs> well, there are people who say I am. Uh, when I went back to the, speaking of films, when I went back to the, to the State Department in 2009, I, I came out of retirement, uh, worked back there for about nine, uh, nine months on Iranian affairs. A lot of the blog, blogosphere comments were quite friendly, you know, even, both for the Iranian and non-Iranian side, but one of them said, oh my God, we have brought back the Manchurian candidate. <laughs> now, I kind of, I like that, because that's one of my all-time favorite movies, the original <laughs> Lawrence Harvey and Frank Sinatra, and Frank Sinatra, wonderful movie. But that, the idea was, I, I was the, is, um, I was somehow the Manchurian candidate, I had been brainwashed in captivity, and now I was working for the other side, and I was working for the other side. No, uh, our Iranian friends and relatives deserve much better than they have. That's very clear. They deserve a government that treats them decently, that doesn't throw them in jail when they express their ide uh, ideas, that doesn't declare war on filmmakers and professors and um, journalists and human rights activists and women's rights activists and all these, these people. They deserve, they deserve that. But I am very uneasy about the United States uh, picking sides and choosing sides in other people's quarrels. Uh, the reason being that our record of doing so is Terrible. You know, I, I take the, you know, we're, I know we're not at the medical school, but what is it? Do no harm? Um, that's sort of my philosophy on this. And by backing, this, by backing a group without necessarily a lot of knowledge or understanding of what it's about, um, you have the opportunity to do a lot of harm. End of the day, this this is and, and, and you may not want to hear this, but this is a decision for Iranians to make, not not the United States. There were things in the Green Movement, uh, frankly, that made people uneasy. Uh, some of the central, the key figures in the Green Movement had very dubious pasts. They're associated with a lot of things that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, that were not democratic and were not inspiring. And so people you know, worried about this. Who are we, who are we supporting? You know, maybe the same, the same thing might apply in Syria. Um, we've been reluctant to get involved in, the, in that, and I think for good, re for good reason. So yes, uh, you know, the Iranians certainly deserve their spring. They deserve something something better. I'm not just I'm not convinced that we that our role of what our role should be. Do no harm. We at the law school have a similar motto which is do no harm unless you have to. 
Let me, let me ask, uh, and please also thank you as a fellow Iran Peace Corps, Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, this, um, you know, I've, I've heard similar things. First of all, as I, as I looked at uh, Michelle Obama presenting the award, those were not generals behind her. Those looked like 20 year old <laughs> non coms uh, in sort of the, the, the military, part of the young military. Uh, people that serve at the White House, that, uh, that serve at the White House. I didn't, I didn't see any stars there or any, gen uh, um, uh, any generals there. Uh, you know, I, yeah, you can spin conspiracy theories. Well, one can spin conspiracy theories of, uh, of, of all sorts. Um, the problem with Argo, uh, and if I were Iranian, I would feel the same way. This is a this does not show us in a good light. It shows it was an episode of violence and fanaticism, and a breakout of violence in, and fanaticism. And if I were Iranian, I would not like to see that. I would, this would remind me of some very <coughs> unpleasant, uh, unpleasant realities. Um, I don't, I'm not comfortable watching you know, movies that would show a real, you know, the realities of slavery, or the realities of our dealing with the Indians <laughs> in this country, or the reality of how we dealt with Japanese America, uh, uh, with Japanese America. This is, uh, uh, this is, is reality. Um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately uh, it is. And it, you're right, it has made people uncomfortable. The idea of revving up uh, uh, war, um, uh, uh, revving up uh, war fever in this country using it? I don't think so. Simply because that is not, as I said earlier, that is not, uh, to my knowledge, the uh, priority of this administration. Uh, this administration. Uh, the other question about sort of how were we treated? Um, unfortunately, unlike what um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Khamenei and Mr. Ahmadinejad said we were not treated very well. Uh, I, I was, I spent, um, I spent of uh, 14 months. I spent nine months in solid, nine months in solitary. Um, how did I cope? Um, I had debates with myself. I usually would win them. <laughs> but you know, there, there, and, and this applies to the law school. There, there, there's an old saying in Persian. Um, um, whoever goes to the judge alone comes back satisfied. So I can usually convince myself of whatever I uh, uh, whatever I needed to. Uh, but one of the things you do in these situations is you establish contact with others. We have, would, would hide notes. We would have a tapping code. We developed a tapping code. Um, to spread word, who have you seen, how have you, how have you been? Um, we were, uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't beaten up uh, or, um, or, you know, uh, beaten with cables or any, any of some of the favorite methods. Uh, that, didn't, that didn't happen. We were threatened. There were uh, mock, there was a mock execution, as I think you saw that in the movie. That did happen. That, uh, that did happen. We were threatened. We um, we didn't have any sources of news. We were isolated. This, and you know, for for all of us who are so used to the internet and you know poking it away at our uh, at our iPhones and, and so forth, um, in, even in this pre-internet day, um, that was difficult. There was no no, no radio, no newspaper, no television. Television. So um, I was in sort of a constant uh, guerrilla war, low level guerrilla warfare to find out what I could. Um, and if I found out what I could, I would use it, one way of coping was I would use it against them. For example, so at one point I figured out, I, I learned that the Shah was no longer in the United States. This was early on. Uh, he was in Panama. Um, and Somebody came in and was giving me, was haranguing me about 
the, the United States, uh, you're, you're going to stay here until the United States returns the Shah. And I said, oh, really? I said, where is the Shah? And he says, he's, oh, he's in the United States. And I said, you know, uh, isn't it true in your religion that lying is a terrible thing? Uh, uh, and, you know, if you, if you lie, if you lie, you lie knowledgeably, lie consciously, uh, that invalidates all of your prayers and all of your fasts. Uh, and isn't it a shame that all of your prayers are invalid? And all your fasts are invalid. That's really a shame. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, and that was sort of my, that was you know, one of my coping strategies, just to plant that little seed of doubt in person uh, uh, in the person's mind. Now, um, some of some of the people, you know, people react, what you learn is people react to stress in different ways. Um, some of it comes out, and some of our people had have had very, very difficult times. And still still do. I mean, you go through the list of there's suicides divorces, nervous breakdowns, um, um, other things that happen. Uh, because people, as I said, people react, uh, react in different ways. Some, you know, some just fight it all the time, some uh, hope out of habit, but, um, and still, I'll, I'll make a pitch for this, I'll, I'll make a pitch for this. Um, despite the opposition of the State Department lawyers, um, we are still pushing for the Iranian authorities to own up to what they've done, they have done, and to provide some kind of compensation. Uh, the bizarre thing, I mean, the, the Iranians have a wonderful saying, they say, politics has no mother and no father. Uh, the bizarre part of this is that um, ta there has been a tacit alliance between the United States government, particularly the, our friends, the State Department lawyers, and um, the Islamic Republic. Both aimed to prevent Iran from having to give any form of compensation. Uh, now, uh, you know, the money would be nice, but I really don't care about that. What I, what I care about is accountability. And until there is some accountability, basically the Iranians will have gotten the way. The message is it's okay to do this, you can get away with it, and there are no consequences. Uh, so far, so far, our efforts to convince the Iranians have gone nowhere. Our efforts to convince the State Department lawyers have gone less than nowhere. <laughs> and that's about where we are at this point. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much.